At the heart of Avatar The Last Airbender is a question. Can any one person ever be too far gone? Can a person ever be so morally ambiguous, or so full of hurt, or so self-destructive that they are beyond redemption? It is this question that fundamentally challenges the central characters of the series, and it is this that the series is reliant on to convey one of its central themes and messages. I've already hinted at one of the series' themes in my previous video, explaining that the concept of friendship and relationship is the crux of many of the character struggles and story points within the show. This much is true for Toph and for Zuko, and beyond them lies another theme that is central to Avatar The Last Airbender. For alongside the theme of friendship is also the theme of moral depravity, or at least it is the question that I have already mentioned. Can a person be so far gone that they are beyond all hope? Can one's nature be inherently wicked enough that in every circumstance, and by any means, that person should be considered irredeemable? There are two characters in this series that both struggle with this theme, this question, in starkly different ways throughout the series, and yet both of their character arcs are built upon this question of morality, this question of how we should perceive and treat those who have done wrong in our lives and in the world. These are the characters of Aang, the last airbender himself, and his closest companion, Katara. What should our attitude toward morally ambiguous people be? What moral action should we take against them? Should we believe in moral depravity? Through these questions, as they are manifested in both Aang and Katara's journey, character is revealed. To begin, the series establishes the characters' respective contexts for the moral question. Katara's mother was killed by the Fire Nation, as was Aang's entire people in a genocide. Therefore, we see the ways in which this context affects the character journeys throughout the seasons. For Katara, this is evident in her experiences with Jet a side character that deals himself with the question of moral depravity, and who comes to a conclusion that results in his own moral ambiguity. Jet says that in order to purge the world of the wickedness of the Fire Nation, there must be sacrifices, as he prepares to drown a whole community in order to liberate it from the Fire Nation. This is a bold move that obviously contradicts itself. Thus, it is a move that is not made out of a call for justice, but instead it is made out of a thirst for revenge. Jet, convinced of his worldview, extends his hand out to Katara, giving her the chance to take part in the expulsion of what he believes to be moral depravity beyond hope, even for a surrounding town of innocence. Katara refuses his offer, and her refusal informs her character arc while at the same time giving an indication into how she might struggle with this concept in the future. Even though she currently lacks the gut to do what Jet calls her to do, will she respond differently to the question of depravity under a different circumstance? As the story pushes on, her character is directed to answer that exact question. For Aang, his struggle is dependent upon the reality of his own circumstance. Though having experienced terrible loss, Aang didn't experience the loss in real time. He only deals with an aftermath, the result of the tragedy, but not the happening of it. Unlike Katara, Aang's morality is less weathered by the world, in that he did not experience the airbender genocide and so the principles of his people are considerably harder to strip away. He maintains that the moral stances of the airbender monks remain intact even in their death, and so he operates out of this position as he deals with his own experiences of moral questioning. This is truest in Aang's relationship to Zuko, who he continuously shows compassion for and who he considers redeemable without having much reason to do so. Time and again, Aang treats Zuko as more than just a villain, but rather as a vague assailant who sits upon the moral fence of a world stage. And even when Zuko proves himself incorrigible, Aang considers his life valuable. If we leave him, he'll die. 
Therefore, Aang stands resolute in his compassion and empathy for humanity, and he initially rejects the concept of moral depravity with ease. For Aang, the moral question of his character is not as much as an intellectual one or a philosophical one. Instead, he often deals with the question of moral depravity in his emotional reactions to circumstances and in his role as the Avatar. For the former, Aang is shown to have trouble maintaining control of his perception of right and wrong in that he can lash out in power with the Avatar state at a moment's notice. And though he often does not choose to let his defensive state overtake his intellect, his will is evidently too weak to counter his emotional programming. For example, Aang lashes out in anger against the man he'd thought had hurt Katara. Though Aang's intellectual morality wouldn't motivate him to cut loose in this way, his emotional morality takes hold as he begins to lay waste to his immediate surroundings. In another example, and in one of the finest moments of the series, Aang once again lashes out in anger against a perceivable threat, those who supposedly kidnapped the only remnant of his past, another character, Appa. Aang is launched into a state of emotional chaos as he confronts those who stole his friend and only Katara's comforting presence can calm his storm. Just as a side note, I would like to point out that there is a reason that these two work as an on-screen relationship. Not simply as a romantic venture, but as one theme manifested in two characters. For this same storm rages inside Katara as well. Katara must continually face the question of moral depravity and she must do so under multiple circumstances and in multiple ways. Following her first encounter with Jet, Katara adopts the belief that Jet is irredeemable. She struggles with believing in Jet's ability to come back from beyond the brink, and she lacks the capacity to trust him. This struggle is just a foreshadow for a later and more important relationship that she will have to deal with in the same way. And so Katara is asked the question of moral depravity, first by Jet, then of Jet, and then again in the finale of Season 2 of Zuko. Upon their imprisonment together, she's compassionate toward Zuko as she hears his point of view and as she begins to understand his struggle. However, when Zuko ultimately fails her, the knife of betrayal sinks deep into Katara, and it creates a wound that will evidently take time and effort to heal. Yet, Katara still chooses to believe in the universal good of people, even of those from within the Fire Nation itself. She believes in their worth, value, and humanity. This is conveyed as she mirrors her key decision in the first season, when she liberates a Fire Nation village from starvation and oppression. Even more so, this is conveyed as she rejects another offer to stand against the Fire Nation in morally ambiguous ways, an offer made by her friend and mentor, Hama. Hama is a picture of Katara in the future. They are both women from the Southern Water Tribe who have both been emotionally and psychologically scarred by the Fire Nation. Hama is what Katara can become should Katara choose to do so. However, as the question of depravity is asked again by Hama, as Katara is tested, Katara still chooses to believe in the ability of the Fire Nation to be redeemed. She refuses to infringe upon their value and right as human beings. And so Katara stands against Hama in her own morality, and her character is again informed and reinforced as one that chooses to reject the notion of moral depravity. That being said, her struggle is not yet complete as she still has yet to deal directly with her own hurt and her own scars. Therefore, she is forced to do so upon the realization that Zuko, who betrayed her before and caused immense grief, will be joining her team as a supposedly redeemed individual. For all of her rejection of the concept of moral depravity, Katara can't seem to bring herself to consider Zuko redeemed. She almost insists that he is a lost cause, as her pain guides her attitude towards him. This is Katara reacting as she did towards Jet in the second season, though in even more profound ways. 
This struggle with Zuko sets the stage for Katara's moral resolution, where Zuko, in an effort to win Katara's approval, extends an offer to act against the powers that have wronged her, just as Jet did and just as Hama did. However, this instance is unique in that this action would not be against Fire Nation innocence or even Fire Nation military. It would be against the literal source of all of her grief. It would be against the man who murdered her mother himself. This is an offer that Katara cannot refuse. Though she believed in innate human value before, under these circumstances, she believes in human moral depravity. She clings to the vision of this man as a monster, not as a human, as someone who is worthy of total rejection and even execution. That being said, at the event horizon of her character arc, at the point of no return, Katara ultimately spares this man. She can't bring herself to execute even that which she believes to be a shell of a man. This decision solidifies her character arc and brings it to completion. Through the moral tests forced upon her, through her struggles and through her conclusions, Katara's character is revealed as unyielding in mercy. Katara remains true to her own moral high ground. Her moral fortitude stands the tests of temptation, and she comes out transformed, not in that she is completely emotionally through her grief. She is not. Instead, she remains a work in progress that is ultimately able to admit forgiveness to Zuko and finally accept his redemption. She walks away strong and broken at the same time, and as an exemplary model of character through morality. As Katara walks away, the tables turn toward Aang as he will soon face the same question of moral depravity in his battle against the Fire Lord. As I've already mentioned, Aang's character, as it is informed through his morality, is given a different approach than Katara's. I've already noted the momentary emotional turmoil that Aang deals with, and explained that Aang comes from a completely different place than Katara when it comes to the question of moral depravity. Instead of his struggle being rooted in grief and a desire for retribution, Aang's struggle is rooted in the emotional turmoil of immediate danger and in the supposed obligation that he feels as the Avatar. In the final four episodes of the series, Aang wrestles with what he knows to be most natural and intuitive for himself and what seems to be most natural and intuitive for everyone else. The last question of moral depravity remains. Should Aang kill the Fire Lord, or should he spare him in a nonviolent fashion? If any character was to be believed as too far gone, surely it would be the infamous antagonist that has plagued the characters since day one. Aang can't come to grips with the ideology that says he must execute the Fire Lord when it goes against everything that he personally believes about life and humanity. Aang, even more so than Katara, believes in the sanctity of life. He can't bring himself to strike down what he knows was once a small, innocent child. And so Aang remains at an impasse. He wages battle against the Fire Lord, all the while waging war with himself regarding what action he should take against the Fire Lord. This struggle being integral to Aang as a character eventually leads Aang to the point where he must confront his own moral event horizon. This comes as a result of Aang's emotional defense, his physical transformation from human bender to godlike being finally kicking in. Just like in previous instances, the Avatar state comes about in full force with a vengeance against the crimes of Fire Lord Ozai. In a rage, the Avatar state takes over Aang's will as it has before, when Aang was not powerful or mature enough yet to take hold of it. However, now having the strength of will to do so, Aang overpowers the Avatar state for the very first time. Aang's moral will takes a stand over his own visceral emotions, and his morality stands firm even in the face of his animal instincts. While the whole world screams at Aang that one way is the only way, Aang finds that way unacceptable. Like Katara, he refuses the concept of moral depravity, and he stands for a morality that pardons and provides second chances. In this way, 
Aang's victory is not just a physical one, but also an immense philosophical one. Katara asked herself the question, was she too weak to strike down her mother's murderer? Or was she strong enough not to? The Fire Lord believes the former of Aang, while the latter is the reality. Aang's power was not in his position as the Avatar, but instead it was in his strength of will and moral courage. It was in his resolve. It was in his character to remain true to what he knew to be true. And so Aang's character comes full circle as he honors and clings to the philosophies left behind from an extinct society. He holds on to the reality of his past while looking toward the future and fully accepting his role as the world's avatar. Aang's moral questioning, and ultimately his moral will, informs and develops his character into a completed arc that has the power to resonate with the young and the old of the series audience alike. All of this to say, in response to the question of moral depravity, the decisions of Katara and of Aang do not provide definitive answers. Instead, the primary effect that these decisions had was sophisticated and natural development of the characters that was executed through delicate writing and nuanced journeys. Although, if there ever was a time in which this series blatantly stated its themes or its answer to the central question, that time came far earlier in the season, in one of the most profound episodes of the entire series. I've already hinted at the significance of this episode in my previous video. There are two central, main themes within Avatar The Last Airbender. In that video, I covered the theme of friendship, in that each character serves to support and develop another in significant ways. And now, in this video, I have covered the theme of moral depravity and the consistency of the question of it throughout the show's seasons. However, these themes grow ripe in an apparently premature way. They come through a tale given to Aang by his predecessor avatar, Roku. In Roku's story from his life, his best friend Sozin betrays him, leaves him for dead, and begins a world conquest that continues in the present. While Katara, Sokka, and Toph all see this as a treacherous tale, Aang perceives it to be something else. He believes it to be a defense against the question of moral depravity, concluding that, if anything, the story proves that anyone is capable of great good and great evil. Everyone even the Fire Lord and the Fire Nation should be treated like they are worth giving a chance. Aang punctuates his sentiment by saying that the tale was also about friendship. And in the most delicately meta way possible, the show points to itself and whispers, that is what this tale is about too. And thus concludes the fourth installment of this Avatar The Last Airbender video essay series. And if you have thought that I've run out of things to say about this series, you're wrong. <laughs> there will be much more on Avatar The Last Airbender for your viewing pleasure. And if you would like more information regarding where you can feast your eyes and ears on that content, please check out this video right here. The long and short of it is that I am launching today a Patreon for this channel. And if you'd like to hear the reasons why, I've got another nifty video for you to watch right here that provides a background for this channel and casts a vision for its future. All of that to say, if you would like more commentary on Avatar, then you can definitely get it through your pledges to the Patreon page. For now, this channel will be developing in more new and exciting ways, and I will begin talking more about various things that we all have the opportunity to have discussion about and appreciate. I believe in the power of cinema. I believe in its value and importance, and so that is why I'm here. 
So let's all continue this conversation regarding film and build up the Weight of Cinema community together. Thanks everyone for watching, for sticking it out to the end, and until next time.